Marvel Zombies. I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to be talking about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I know, YouTube, you don't really see that too much on YouTube. But I'm also going to be ranking the movies uh, from worst to best. Now, quick feelings about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's kind of almost a miracle exists because as a comic book fan, I've been told so many things can't be done. This can't be done. This can't be done. Uh, you can't put so many characters together. You can't put too goofy of a costume on somebody. Apparently you can. And uh, one of the things I like so much about this is that they have been able to bring the experience of a superhero universe that we comic book fans have been enjoying for years and has brought it to the big screen and the small screen for a whole new audience to experience. And it's kind of amazing also to listen to like a new crop of fans say and react in ways what we've been saying and reacting for years and years. And it's pretty fun. Uh, I like it a lot. I, I think uh, overall the uh, experiment has been an overwhelming success. To be honest, I said this when the first Avengers movie came out, and I said that Marvel won. Even if you stop here at Avengers, they won. They succeeded in proving you could do this, and they really did change things. And I'll talk about Avengers as we go on. Uh, but we've seen other film uh, studios try this uh, with certain levels of success. Uh, at first, DC and Warner Brothers was stumbling a lot, but it does seem like they're finding their footing and kind of figuring out what makes their characters and comic books unique. And that seemed to be exciting. There seemed to be, you know, they seem to have, like, found their mojo on how that's working. And look, there's other, like, universes, like, uh, geez, what the, the, what do you call it? The, uh, the Haunted House uh, movies, the, uh, oh, I can't remember. Uh, but uh, they're doing a whole bunch of like movies related to this, you know, horror themed couple that uh, like uh, what about the, the Annabelle movies and I can't remember the name of the first movie, but uh, essentially uh, we get we got like another one of the Fast and Furious universe and yeah, it, it's interesting the way they're working. Of course, you know the Universal Monsters uh, attempt you know failed horribly. Uh, which is amazing because they're kind of the originators of this concept. Uh, so you thought that would have been a good idea, but oh well. So here we go. I'm going to be talking about my favorite all the way down. Let's actually, we're going to be doing the my least favorite all the way down to my favorite. We're going to be ranking the movies. Number 23. Alright, number 23 is <sighs> Thor The Dark World. Now, I'm a person who does not like to go with the grain and all the the bandwagon uh, fans and how they, you know, get on something. But, you know what? This is one of those cases where everybody's right. Uh, Thor The Dark World is at least the weakest of the cinematic films and I gotta say it's partly due to a little bit of the film really not understanding what it wants to be you know it goes back and forth from comedy to dark epic story and when it worked in the first Thor and worked in Ragnarok it didn't quite work in uh, Thor Dark World and that's I'm going to just say it's just a matter of editing and pacing on that one. Uh, just kind of missed the bar. So, all right. Number 22, Doctor Strange. Now, I know a lot of people really love this film. I am okay with it. Uh, maybe it has a lot to do with uh, me not being the biggest Doctor Strange fan. Uh, he's never a character that's, like, grabbed me. I, he, I find him interesting. He can be done well, but by myself... I, I can't really get too far into them. Um, I do have uh, some issues on casting on that film where I thought they could have done things a little bit better. 
Uh, but overall, I thought it was a good start, but not one that really like got me super excited where I want to see the movie again. Number 21, The Incredible Hulk. Now, The Incredible Hulk is the second Marvel Cinematic Universe film, and the thing that really got people excited was the fact that it was right on the heels, like with a month or two of Iron Man, which had been like, you know, killing people left and right at the box office. People were really excited and blowing their minds, especially at the uh, stinger, at the post credit scene where Nick Fury shows up and says, Avengers. And that got people really excited and thinking. And then lo and behold, this one also has a pre credit, uh, excuse me, a post credit scene with Robert Downey Jr. showing up being Robert Downey Jr. and saying, hey, General Ross, what's that uh, Hulk guy doing? Uh, I'd like to talk to him about uh, this Avengers thing. Um, yeah, it's not a perfect film, but it is an entertaining film. It does move, uh, but it does seem to have some, uh, I don't know, it has, it does seem a little bland when you've, like, put it with other films, the, especially the later films. It does kind of just fall down the road. Uh, all right, number 20, Thor. Now, Thor at 20 seems like a big loss, but you know what? Uh, I will say this, the film is kind of important because it is the first of the Marvel Cinematic Universes that took a chance with something different. Now, I remember this being considered a risk, uh, them doing Thor, because that was just really fantastic, uh, had this epic fantasy quality to it, and the films had so far been fairly realistic-ish action movies, and comic book films really haven't done that. Like, if you're doing a film like Batman, you're not going to have the Atom or Hawk people or, you know, uh, Gorilla City show up in the next Batman movie. Uh, that will be weird. You can't really, you know, do that. That will contradict things. It will be strange. This is the first film to really kind of take that chance. I was like, eh, maybe not. Uh, I think my biggest problem with this film is that it feels restrained and that has to do a lot with the fact of when it happened. And they were, like, afraid of, like, going too far with it. And I understand that. Uh, so it unfortunately, you know, puts it at number 20 on this list. Number 19 is Ant-Man. Now, Ant-Man uh, was always thought of as a joke, and when they announced this film, people couldn't believe it. But the idea of doing it as a heist film and a comedy action film, and you could put Paul Rudd in it and, you know, Michael Douglas, it worked, and it uh, worked quite a bit. Uh, I guess the only real things that, uh, you know, don't put it, you know, much higher on the list is it's really has an unspectacular villain and it was one of those marvel cinematic universe films that kind of lend itself to that idea that you know they don't have great villains oh uh, and it's a film you could also kind of skip maybe it's one of those kind of skippable uh films but you sit down and watch it and it's pretty fun so there you go number 18 iron man 2. now uh, this might be surprising to some of you because uh, usually Thor The Dark World and Iron Man 2 are usually at the bottom of everybody's lists. But, I don't know, I sit down and watch Iron Man 2, it's fun. I have fun watching it. Yeah, it's really awkward in its structure, where uh, this is before uh, the producers had figured out how to lay the groundwork for future films without interrupting the pace and uh, tone of their the film that's going on. Uh, so this is where they were still kind of having baby steps on that. And yeah, there's some clunky scenes, particularly in the middle, but um, I sit down and watch this film and it's fun. Uh, I dig it a lot. There's a lot of good humor in it. Uh, the action scenes when they happen are just amazing. So I don't know, I'm a sucker. And of course, like, look, Justin Hammer's dance at the end with his seminar, his big show, he's trying to show up Tony Stark Oh, uh, that's, that's great. That's probably top 10, one of my favorite moments in these movies. All right, let's go to 17, and that's Ant-Man and the Wasp. And that is one of those sequels that's an improvement on the original one. 
Uh, we finally bring in the Wasp, which was one of the complaints a lot of people had, including me, that uh, they didn't bring, uh, not Janet, but, uh, oh, not Nadia. <laughs> she is, this is a new character. So, uh, let's see, she, you know, she doesn't have a chance to be the Wasp. And the whole movie kind of teases us like, oh, she can't be the Wasp, blah, blah, blah. This is about Ant-Man. And this one just shares the credit with the title with her. And, man, she just really knocks it out. And, of course, uh, this film I really does feel like it does cut some of the fat that was from the, the first one. Uh, it's a bit more entertaining. The villain's a bit more um, relatable and uh, complex and interesting. Uh, I had a good time with this film. Uh, let's see, where are we? We are at 16, and that, of course, is Iron Man, the film that started it all. Man, everybody went ballistic for this film, and you can tell why. It looks great. I remember seeing the first trailer, be really visibly excited for it. And this is a character who, like, up until, <clears throat> like, up until this film, like, a lot of mainstream fans hadn't really heard much of Iron Man. He was sometimes regarded as a B-lister to, like, the outside normies. Um, he was an A-lister to us comic fans, but to be honest, like, you know, the 90s was not a good decade for, for Iron Man, so much so that Marvel threw him away uh, for a good while. Um, and now he's back, and he is, like, one of the mainstays of Marvel now because of this film, and this really did set the tone and got everyone excited. This was a very important film. Uh, it does kind of, like... Uh, linger at times, and the third act could have been a little bit stronger, but boy, man, Robert Downey Jr. is, of course, brilliant. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow is brilliant. Uh, their chemistry makes a lot of this film work. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, dunk on Gwyneth Paltrow for being a Hollywood weirdo, but good lord, what a great actress she is. Um, I absolutely love Pepper, and I think she has been, like, an important part of this film franchise. Um, okay. Let's see, where are we? We are at... I'm completely lost. Where am I now? I am at 15, and we are talking about Avengers Infinity War. And, yeah, I'm sorry this film is so low on this list, but uh, a lot of the films above it, are I can't really place them under this. This is, this is a huge film, and in a way advances what they already did with the the first Avengers film. They do a lot of great stuff here. Uh, the fact that they are able to blend so many characters, uh, storylines. This is a sequel to several movies. And they do something ingenious by the fact that we already know all these characters and we know their stories and they, we know how they work together. So we took the villain and made him the protagonist. He's not the hero, he's the villain. But we follow him through the movie, and we give him kind of like this, like, uh, he has these, like, third act, all hope is lost kind of moments for him, the villain, where he might not be able to commit genocide. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we, we see all the characters, like, you know, get together and make this stand. And, man, it really is ballsy the way it ends. Uh, it, it's still stunning that they just ended it as quiet as they did. I'm... Still impressed by it. Oh, uh, why it's so low on the list? I'm sorry. There's so many other films I'd like a little bit better. Um, I guess a personal feeling on the film is it's kind of a bummer and a lot of seeds, so it makes rewatches a little more difficult. Uh, okay, uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron is number fourteen, and. Uh, Ultron is great, and he's definitely one of those villains that would have been a difficult villain to do in a uh, future film. He's also really complex in the fact that um, yeah, he's, he's, he's not terribly wrong. And, it, you know, um, Tony Stark really literally did create him. Uh, and that, that's another thing, uh, comparing from the films to the comics, where Hank Pym created him. Uh, for the sake of this film franchise, it does make more sense that Tony created him. And also, it does make more sense where it uh, lines up with a lot of what's going on. Uh, shit, this film 
does some really good stuff as far as like um, uh, planting seeds for what picks up in Infinity War and Endgame. Oh my god, it's really, it's amazing how long ago they had these uh, story arcs kind of like figured out, or at least kind of like worked on, like okay, we're trying to get here. Uh, very cool. Uh, I guess I would say probably the thing that really does not work for me, uh, for the most part, is the, the Black Widow-Hulk relationship. I don't know if it works. It it, do, it never felt like it worked. And uh, I understand why those characters connected, but it didn't really have to be a relationship, uh, if that makes any sense. And th there is that... There's that scene where uh, Black Widow like compares herself to a monster, uh, to him, and she does make that she does make that mention about uh, being made inf infertile. Uh, and some people, by the way, you're not wrong if you take it this way. Some people take it as like you know she couldn't give birth, therefore she thought of herself as a monster. I thought of it uh, as she, she's been made infertile, so therefore she could sleep with intended targets and not have to worry about getting pregnant so she can concentrate on killing them. Um, that doesn't sound great uh, as far as like a person. So I can see why that would be uh, a stickler. But you know, to be honest, if you're mad about it in that way, you're not wrong. I ain't going to take it away from you. Uh, but um, I feel like the film may have gone a few minutes too long. I'd say maybe... I don't know where I could have shaved 20 minutes, but it feels like it's 20 minutes too long. I don't know, although when I think about it, I don't know what scenes it would cut, but I do feel like it's a bit long. Um, that's the best I can give on that. So, all right, now let's go to number 13. And I guess we're up to my favorite Iron Man movie. It's number three. And that's the one that uh, was very divisive for a lot of people. Some people hated it, some people loved it. I loved it. And I, first off, um, the Shane Black script is great. Shane Black's tone and feel made it unique compared to some of the other Marvel films, and still to this day. Um, it's nice to see a Shane Black movie in the middle of the cinematic universe. Um, I know there's uh, people like really mad about the Mandarin twist on that. Uh, Mandarin Trist is one of my favorite drinks. Um, you can get it uh, at 7-Eleven. Mandarin Twist. It's oh, lovely. Mm. But no, I actually like the Mandarin Twist. Because I'll be honest with you, I am leery, leery on the way Asians are portrayed in uh, films, especially at the point when this film came out. Uh, things are a little better now, a few years later, but particularly Mandarin as himself kind of comes off as, as a stereotype, the Fu Manchu villain stereotype uh, that a lot of Asians were required to play, and especially it's more noticeable when everyone else is white, and the bad guy is this guy. Uh, I'm really glad that they turned that around. First off, I thought they were turning it around where um, he was playing like sort of this Middle Eastern version of Mandarin, which still is iffy. Um, and then it turned out to be a complete fake. And it was this white guy pretending to be like uh, like, like this foreign uh, villain. And I loved it. And I have to say that I know that's the part where it breaks or makes for people, and that scene makes it for me. Uh, that were, To me, that's where it went from being a really good film to a great film. And if some people can't get on board with that, sorry. All right, uh, let's go to number 12, and number 12 is Spider-Man Homecoming. And this is another film that takes a little bit of departure from the original comics, uh, in that we focus a lot on uh, Spider-Man being a uh, kind of intern to Iron Man, and we don't really touch on Uncle Ben in actually both Spider-Man films. Which, to be honest, is okay, because uh, I think even film audiences are very aware of that. Uh, I know it does kind of like create this idea of like, well, where's his motivation? And it's only hinted at, but I I'm willing to forgive it, because it's been giving us new things for Spider-Man to do in this film and the other film. I love the tone of being like a 
a teen romantic comedy mixed in with superhero stuff. Uh, the twist with the vulture is fantastic. Uh, didn't see that one coming. I was completely stupefied when I saw that. Michael Keaton is great. Absolutely wonderful. I love him when he plays villains. He's so great. And like uh, Zendaya, is, Zendaya is great. Uh, and Tom Holland is a wonderful Spider-Man. He really plays the awkwardness well. He shows up uh, as an action hero well. I, I just absolutely love these Spider-Man movies. And Homecoming is just neat. All right, now, number 11, Captain Marvel. Now, I'm a bit biased because I love Captain Marvel and I love Karen De Carol Danvers. So I felt like I was going to really like this film. Uh, and Brie Larson, you know, she's, she's a really likable actress. And I've been kind of like discovering her in like, you know, Scott Pilgrim, uh, Kong Island. She was in that, uh, that shoot 'em up movie. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, she's very funny and cool in that. So I kind of watched her kind of like build up to this kind of movie and this kind of character. And she kind of nails it. Um, Carol is one of those characters that's been beat down her whole life and she's been told she's nothing. And all she has is her. And she, she kind of like has this, it's this interesting twist where um, she's been captured by the Kree and brainwashed and told you know, to keep keep yourself down, keep yourself down as much as you can because it's dangerous to others. And of course, the villain means to keep like her superpowers down. He's not even thinking about the social politics of that, obviously. But we understand that as a film audience. Uh, and Carol understands that, at least subconsciously. And that's kind of one of the things that I really like about the film. Of course, the action, uh, when it shows up, is great. The 90s feel to the movie, I think, is really authentic. I'm still blown away by the de-aging effects on uh, Nick Fury. Uh, blown away by that. Uh, there's a lot of really good humor. The scrolls are great. I Nothing beats the lead scroll showing up, uh, sucking on like some soda pop, going, hey, got you surrounded. Like, they didn't even care. Um, it's great stuff. Uh, I definitely... I love the movie, but, you know, if I had to confess, it's still kind of a mid-level Marvel movie. It's definitely a movie that shows that it can be really improved upon within 2 and 3. Alright, so, we're at number 10. Spider-Man Far From Home is our number 10 movie. Well, my number 10 movie. And it's the most recent um, MCU film. It's going to be the last MCU Spider-Man uh, with uh, its deal with Sony breaking up. And uh, I'm still looking forward to uh, the third part. Uh, I know, I know uh, what's going on, but uh, I'm confident uh, the third part will be on par with the other two. Uh, so, one of the things, many of the things I love about this uh, film is, first off, uh, I love the fact that they keep uh, the kind of uh, teen comedy uh, situation with this uh, film series. Uh, him and the uh, other, his other friends that he gets along with uh, feel really authentic and fun and it's a nice corner of the MCU to see. Uh, it, uh, the stakes for the most part in the film are played down, which to be honest, I know some people wanted to see uh, more darker series reactions to uh, the blip, but to be honest, uh, we, 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 need a, we need to come down from all that stuff. Um, can't be serious all the time. And to be honest, there would be a lot of people, there would be a lot of humor derived from that situation, especially when, uh, as far as the world's concerned, kind of had a happy ending to this horrible thing. Um, so I'm glad we got a lot of stuff like that. And uh, also, uh, nice tidbits from previous uh, Iron Man movies. We get to see, like, paid off here. Jake Gyllenhaal's performance is absolutely wonderful. He's doing kind of two roles, playing Mysterio, where he's pretending to be like a really cool, older superhero helping out uh, the new guy. And then we see that turn and how sinister he is and how focused he is. It's never over the top, but boy, is it intimidating. Love it, and I love that he had a team instead of one guy doing the whole thing. Uh, that, From what we know about visual effects and uh, stuff like that, feels just more authentic, and it uh, definitely pays off. We get, of course, 
uh, J.K. Simmons returning as J. Jonah Jameson. Uh, Zendaya is MJ is great. Uh, I don't know. I just really like the film. And I'm hoping uh, all the drama between uh, Sony and Disney doesn't damage the third film. So we'll see. All right. Number nine. Number nine is Endgame, the big, big, big film uh, that, frankly, all this stuff is kind of leading to. Uh, and I know what you're saying, like, shouldn't this be number one? Well, the most important isn't always the best, uh, but holy crap, uh, this film <sighs> it does uh, a lot of what Infinity War does. Uh, it's a very satisfying second part to the story, as well as a satisfying conclusion to the Infinity Saga uh, phase of the MCU, where we get to see all sorts of things pay off for all our main characters. Uh, Iron Man, Captain America, Thor. Uh, we get to see stuff with Hawkeye and, uh, and Black Widow. Uh, we get to see like Captain Marvel show up and punch down a spaceship. That's pretty cool. And uh, let's see, all the interactions. Hulk is great. I love seeing Peter David's merged Professor Hulk show up. Uh, in one of these films. To be honest, I never thought that would. And he's absolutely wonderful through the film. I love his kind of chill persona. Uh, you get the sense that this character's going through a lot of pain, so this is kind of nice to see him. Um, let's see, the stuff with the time heist is just genius. Because I had a feeling they would try and the, the gauntlet wouldn't work and they'd have to do something else, but the time heist thing is fantastic. Also, it's a nice way of working Ant-Man in because that's kind of his thing in his movies and it blends really well here. And that's a really good proper use of using characters from different superhero genres uh, in one big epic story. And speaking of epic, that last battle scene, <sighs> that's something as a comic fan, a lifelong superhero fan, I thought I'd never see in a movie this kind of Lord of the Rings-ish final battle, and boy, I mean, that was worth 10 years uh, to see. Excellent. Uh, like, we get to see uh, relationships formed in that fight, we even get to see, uh, like, Iron Man and Pepper Potts, like, working alongside of each other. Uh, we get to see uh, that wall of women show up and uh, help try and get the gauntlet to, to the place it needs to be. Uh, it's great. Just really good. Really good stuff. Uh, all right. Number eight is Thor Ragnarok. And this is when the Thor movies kind of figured it out uh, for the most part. Tiger Ratiti's uh, direction is wonderful. He paces like action and humor. It's gorgeous. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful Marvel Cinematic films to look at. There's so much Jack Kirby splattered all over this movie. And it's just amazing to watch and you know the first couple of Thor films were a little afraid to really jump into that universe uh, but this one I guess with the confidence of Guardians of the Galaxy behind it this film felt really confident in what it was doing and we get to see different worlds and like performances of great Kate Blanchett as hell is amazing uh, Jeff Goldblum as Jeff Goldblum the evil space emperor is great uh, and let's see, you know, the relationship with Hulk, we get to get that little bit of like uh, Planet Hulk mixed in here. Uh, and of course, Valkyrie is just a presence, let's just say that. Uh, the humor, uh, I know a lot of people either loved it or hated it because of the humor. I'm a person who loved it. Uh, I thought it just felt really strong and gave it like a huge breadth of fresh air. Uh, even though there are times where I, I felt like they overstepped the line, where maybe there's a couple moments that should have let sit as dramatic moments, uh, that they had to do a joke. You know, there's two or three places where I wish they'd done that. Otherwise, I love this movie. It's really great. Uh, all right. Number seven is Captain America Civil War. And this is probably one of the more serious MCU films. And... It was a much needed, you know, change of pace because we kind of got used to what the Marvel Cinematic Universe films were like, and this one was a big punch in the gut. Uh, of course, that big shocking reveal of Hydra had been like secretly infiltrating Shield for decades, uh, right on the nose of uh, our characters. Um, it feels really. 
grounded and serious and really kind of important. And it, I got to tell you, like, that speech Captain America has where he uh, speaks to all of S.H.I.E.L.D. and tells them, like, look, the guy next to you might be a Hydra agent. That's a really intense scene. And it is one of those moments that kind of feels real. The more, you know, we have seen our politics split us apart and we've seen how dark people we were friends with, family with, and even like just associated with, how intense their politics might get. And it's kind of like scary in that regard. Uh, and this does it. Uh, of course, we get the stuff with uh, the Winter Soldier coming back and that reveal is awesome. Even though comic book fans knew it was coming, non-comic book fans watching the movie definitely had a like, big surprise on that part. Um, like I said, some of the action scenes are great. Heck, the Nick Fury versus the Hydra Cops is a really great scene. Love all that stuff. Uh, great movie. And uh, of course, uh, we have like a bam, like uh, Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow is really cool. Uh, and Robert Redford is a, he's a really great performance in this, and he's a really great uh, Marvel villain. I know people at this time were still beating up on Marvel villains, but Jeez, he's so strong and so subtle, and you know he's not over the top at all. He's just more matter of fact, uh, and it's pretty intense. He's really focused on it. All right, so let's go to number six, and number six is another Captain America movie, Civil War, and yeah, this is practically a Avengers film as well. And I know there were some par comparisons to this and uh, Batman vs Superman: Dawn of Justice. And I know some people wanted to not compare them because, like, oh, they're totally different things. No, they're they're both superhero movies where uh, two uh, characters, one with uh, a lot of like high tech super equipment versus like a like an inspirational, uh, p uh, physically powerful hero, are fighting uh, on different ideologies and. You know, there are other characters that come into play, and it's kind of the same kind of movie. And it's weird that they both came at the same time. This one, of course, does it really strongly. It uh, does also have the advantage of having some movies behind its back uh, to kind of like, you know, help focus the, um, the drama and the tension. So we already get to know these guys, and, you know, these actors already know their, their characters well. <sighs> and it doesn't dig too deeply in the politics of uh, the situation that uh, they're, they're put in with the Sokovia Accord. And, you know, it goes deep enough for us to get it. You know, where is the responsibility on, you know, these kind of characters and how they interact with the world and where it goes. And, of course, that comes right into Cap's situation where he's trying to protect his friend. And, then we, of course, get to that final conflict between uh, Captain America and Iron Man, where we think everything's done. And ain't done. It actually gets much worse. Uh, Baron Zemo is another quiet, understated performance. Uh, I call him Baron Zemo, but he's just called Zemo. Zemo is a quiet, understated villain, and he's probably one of the most successful villains in the whole franchise because uh, he set out to break up the Avengers, and he succeeded. I mean, yeah, he got thrown in jail, but he succeeded. That that was the plan. Um, very good, Zemo. Very good. Uh, you were an underrated villain in both MCU and the comics. So, okay. Uh, and, of course, we get that great battle scene. And that battle scene at the airport, of course, we introduce uh, Spider-Man. Uh, Black Panther shows up in that. Uh, actually, he shows up previously in a different scene, but, you know, he shows up t uh, to meet the others. We get, like, Ant-Man, he becomes Giant-Man. It's it's a nice kind of, like, practice scene for uh, battle scenes and more interactions. And what's great is the film is mostly very serious, and we have Giant-Man fighting, like, Spider-Man at an airport and all that crazy crap going on, and it still pays off. And that is proof that you can mix genres uh, as long as we're invested seriously in what you're doing as a story, you can go nuts with something like that. Uh, and of course, that would 
pay off later in other films. All right, number, where are we? We are at number five. And it is Guardians of the Galaxy, number two. And this is, this was actually very difficult. Um, I was going back and forth in which one I was going to put higher on this list between the original Guardians of the Galaxy and Volume 2. And it was almost a coin flip. These films are both wonderful in the way they open up the Marvel Universe, uh, the character interactions, and with, you know, Star-Lord, Gamora, uh, Rocket, Groot, uh, the whole gang. You know, the film is also gorgeous to look at. We This one has Kurt Russell, and Kurt Russell is always great. He is he just has that wonderful swagger that I just absolutely adore, and, and whatever character he plays, either heroes or villains, doesn't matter. Um, it's fun seeing him in 70s mode uh, with that digital makeup. It's great stuff. And, you know, the, the action is wonderful. Uh, we developed the plot really well. I love those yellow aliens that are the ones who end up making uh, Adam Warlock. I love that whole regalness that, you know, they can't, like, show up without making a big deal and rolling out the carpet and, you know, being, like, weirdos about it. Uh, I love that stuff. Um, I also dig the fact that they, like, uh, send out like, like kind of drones, because uh, of course they would. They don't want to get their hands dirty, personally, uh, which also does kind of make them a threat because they don't care <laughs> about those drones. Uh, of course, we got Ego, uh, the Living Planet, and wow, Ego is quite impressive. It's a nice payoff <clears throat> to the um, the mystery of who Star Lord is. Uh, we get to see Mantis in here. Mantis is uh, really adorable, frankly, and her relationship with uh, Drax is really nice. Um, and, of course, look, the father-son stuff, and the father's... Uh, it's, it's really heartbreaking, and it's really touching and beautiful. Uh, it's one of the biggest, like, emotional films of this series, because, uh, you know, most have, like, you know, different emotions and action and comedy, but this one really does... Uh, really strongly go for the heart, uh, more so than most every film on here. Uh, absolutely wonderful movie, and I can't wait for James Gunn to come back with uh, Vine 3. I'm very much interested to see what he does with the Guardians after Endgame. Uh, I assume he had a plan for that. All right, what's number four, you might ask? Well, the original Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, tell you the truth, it was almost a coin flip, really. Uh, both these films are great. for. The same reasons I just said. Uh, I was really uh, struck in emotion uh, with uh, the relationship Storler has with his mother, and you know she's dead through the uh, pretty much through the entire film except for the first scene. And the way they use the soundtrack is genius uh, in that it's his relationship with his mother, and it almost represents her through the entire like film and almost like she's in a weird way narrating it uh, for us like she's there the entire time <sighs> beautiful stuff of course you know like I mentioned the action and this was one of the films that really opened up the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, because it was a very B-list property going on in uh, the comics and of course totally unheard of in the mainstream audiences and pff, this really changed things um, and it definitely did change things for not just other movies, but like the Marvel Cinematic Universe and other movies um, outside of it. It just, it, it's just a lot of, a lot of good fun. Uh, all right, now, number three. All right, we got the top three already? Okay, number three is Marvel's Avengers. And I mentioned a couple times uh, I had never thought I'd see this in a movie, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is the first I never thought I'd see this in a movie. Because um, this is the one that really tied the cinematic universe together and proved it can be done. Uh, because up until then, they were uh, each their own franchises that were kind of tied together. And this was the one they were kind of building to and really kind of fused 
all these films into one franchise. Uh, it's a sequel to like all, all three of the films that had come out uh, before then, Captain America, Thor, Iron Man. Uh, we get to see uh, Black Widow had appeared in uh, previous films, Hawkeye, and yeah, it just comes together so well. Uh, and of course, it wisely uses Loki as the one who brings the Avengers together like he did in the comics. The interactions between the, all these characters are great, uh, particularly the Iron Man and Captain America uh, are absolutely wonderful. There's so many iconic moments in this, and this was the first, I believe this is the first film that felt very comfortable with looking like a comic book movie, looking like a Marvel movie. Um, I remember there were several moments in this movie where I thought, no, that is a Marvel comic panel. Um, and up until this movie, there's so many comic book films that had come out that were afraid of looking like comic books. And this one just like, not interested, let's do it. Um, it's just a wonderful piece. Of course, uh, that last action sequences in the Battle of New York um, is the thing I'd always wanted to see. And I absolutely love the film. There, I know objectively they've made some better movies since then, but I don't know, this made a huge impact. So uh, I can't not think of it any any better than uh, than three. It's a good it's a good movie. All right, now number two is another Captain America movie, and uh, it is the first Avenger. Now I know uh, objectively probably the next two are probably better movies. I know a lot of people prefer them, uh, but this was a great movie to me, and uh, it was the exact correct decision to do a period film set in World War II. Uh, unlike the previous uh, Captain America uh, attempts, the TV movie just put it in the, the present day, and the 1990 movie put literally kind of the first 15 minutes in World War II and then jumped to the present day. No, this one was smart. Like, no, let's make this a pulpy comic book superhero war movie and it's it, visually it's very different than the Marvel films that came before it uh, Hulk Iron Man Thor you know it has its own flavor Joe Johnston was the right director to do it he has done like films in this area era before he understands it and once he was like selected as director I knew we were in good hands and like Chris Evans uh, as Captain America was just a genius pick um, Haley Atwell is absolutely wonderful, and Tommy Lee Jones, who's been in comic book movies before. Um, Men in Black, great performance. Uh, Batman Forever, not so great performance. He doesn't seem to have a real respect for superheroes in comic books, but holy crap, he's really great in this movie, and that's probably because he's playing, like, a character that he really excels at, you know, the, this general, this gruff general. Uh, in World War II. Holy crap, he's wonderful. Uh, even though, yeah, he doesn't believe in Steve at first. And he's proved wrong. And what, what's cool is, he's cool with that. Like, oh, okay, great. He can do it? Fine. Uh, absolutely uh, adorable chemistry between um, uh, Chris Evans and Haley Atwell. They're absolutely wonderful together. Uh, your heart breaks when they can't be together at the end. Uh, of course, the Red Skull is wonderful in, in this, really evil and uh, menacing, and the right amount of over-the-top. Not too far over-the-top, uh, but enough to go, holy crap, this this guy is a threat. And, uh, you know, it doesn't... In, there's a lot of interesting things, like... Um, uh, uh, there's some discussions about, you know, the Nazis and uh, coming to power, and then Hydra coming to power through them... Um, I, there's actually, Stanley Tucci, ha as the scientist who, you know, creates, um, Captain America has this, uh, wonderful line about the Nazis, and, uh, you know, he, he, he talks to Steve about, oh, so you want to kill Nazis, like, well, I don't want to, and he goes into this thing about, like, I don't want to really kill anybody, I just don't like bullies, and, you know, he has this conversation about, you know, uh, 
he does this interesting thing where he threads the needle between like Nazis and Germans, where he's, he explains that the first country the Nazis took over were Germany. And yeah, um, that's, that's, I like that it makes that kind of distinction because that is an ideology um, that can happen anywhere. And it very subtly suggests that in that line. So just beautiful work. I, I, I adore this film and I, I just, I can't. It was my favorite Marvel film for a good long while. Until number one came out. And number one is Black Panther. Yeah, uh, they've done, I guess, bigger films uh, with, with like Infinity War and Endgame and stuff like that. But this is their best film. This is a cohesive superhero uh, fantasy, sci-fi, uh, kingdom I intrigue, a spy film, superhero film. <sighs> it's wonderful. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm a person who like is aware of Black Panther and occasionally will read him in other uh, titles, but he's never been like the character you know I've really latched onto. And this was absolutely amazing. And I, I love how, uh, let's see, well, Chadwick Boseman, it, like a, uh, several of the people I've mentioned on here, he just oozes charisma and it's a really smooth, uh, not trying too hard kind of charisma. He just kind of is that character. Uh, we, of course, have like so many other characters like Suri, uh, let's see, of course, uh, Killmonger, uh, holy crap, like, Michael B. Jordan is just a presence, and they were really lucky to have him because he's able to uh, perform that type of villain that I 100% get what you're talking about. Um, if you weren't doing this other thing, I'd be right on your side, but uh, you're making the wrong choice uh, based on the correct information. Um, and I love how it doesn't really let our heroes off the hook on... The whole premise of uh, Wakanda is that it's been able to protect itself through its superior technology for centuries, and it's not been colonized, and it's not been ruined uh, by the white colonization that you know has like touched all over the world. This is what it could look like if it wasn't affected by that. But on the other hand, they haven't helped anybody. You know, they could have helped people, but they didn't. They chose to protect themselves. So, yeah, not perfect. Uh, and of course, that's what Killmonger brings up when he like comes up and says, no, hey, I'm a rightful heir to this throne. And I'm going to rule things the way I want to. Um, by the way, when um, T'Challa like, takes over, this isn't like something that hasn't occurred to him. And this is actually before Killmonger even shows up. This is kind of like a moral struggle he is going on. Like, there are people on either side of this argument uh, that are befriending him saying, hey, yeah, I agree, we should like expand our technology and help others. And others are going, no, no, we need to protect our own. We need to stay within these walls and, you know, watch for uh, Wakanda first. And uh, that's, of course, the very subject that gets brought up, you know, right in his face. Um, holy crap, the... Uh, the sequence catching claw is very James Bondy and lots of fun, uh, with a lot of Batman, Spider-Man kind of uh, activity going on there. I love uh, the technology all used in this. It's really superior, interesting technology that hasn't been really done in other Marvel movies, like through the Tony Stark stuff. Um, it has its own kind of flavor, and you know it does seem, geez, like vastly superior to what we've seen in the other movies. Uh, so they definitely have their point, and I don't know, it just. Also has a one fun, fun, wonderful, uh, fun pace. It's uh, probably the best blend of humor and action and, and drama uh, in all of these movies, I'd say. And it it also, to boot, has something really serious to say, uh, which I think just, I can't, I can't think of a better movie for me. I absolutely love it. And you know, when Kevin Feige finished watching it, uh, he was right next to Ryan Cooley, and he told him, like, that's the best movie we've done. And you know what? I agree. I absolutely love it. And so, 
There you go. That's my ranking list of the MCU films from 23 to 1. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope uh, we have a lot of agreement, or I don't know, if you disagree too, that's fun. Uh, hey, you can uh, list in the comments below what do you think of my choices? Do you have your own choices? You know, feel free to kind of let me know what you think is your ranking of all these films. All these films. And of course, we'll have them for at least a few more years to go, uh, the way it's looking. Not to mention the Disney Plus TV shows, which now I gotta figure out how to like rate them. Like, do they count as movies or should they be separate? I don't know. We'll, we'll see. All right, well, that was a journey. So, hey, if you want to follow me on the various social medias in this universe, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm in, on Instagram. You can support this channel with just a dollar a month over on Patreon. Uh, not to mention uh, the Red Knight comic is coming out soon. You can follow it on Facebook as well. Also, oh, hey, you know, uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the notification bell if you want to hear more about the real Matos and all my shenanigans. All right. I think we're done now, so push the button, Lindsay. They don't play the song on the radio. They don't show that it's on the radio. They don't know that we are the media. They don't know that we start the media. I don't want to see what I'm making you. I see some big seat and I'm shaking you. Walking down the street.